What's up, everybody? It is Izzy back today with the Q and A. Took yesterday off. Um, I was just really sick. I've been sick for a couple days. <clears throat> yesterday I slept for like literally 13 hours, and what do you know? I feel a lot better today. Anyway, what you're gonna see in this workout here is a lot of unilateral work. In fact, every single exercise that I did, I did unilaterally. And that's because I have some sort of weird pressing imbalance that's been going on with my barbell work and even to a lesser extent, Smith machine pressing. Those are basically my favorite movements for pressing. So I wanna be able to put those back in my program, but I don't wanna get into a situation where I'm uh, relying much more on one side than the other is in my experience, this leads to injuries. I've had a lot of pec tweaks over the past four years, way more than I should. Maybe, you know, like one every six months. And they're never serious. They last like four to six weeks maybe. But I'm kind of tired of that happening, so I'm going to try to fix it here with this unilateral work. First actual question of the day, do you have elite genetics for building strength? The weight you put up is incredible. Well, first of all, thank you for the compliment, but no, I would say I do not have elite genetics. I take that term like very seriously. Like if I'm thinking of somebody who has elite genetics for football speed, you know, I'm thinking of somebody that runs a 4440 or faster. So, you know, it, it's, it's the like, not just the 1%, but the 0.1% kind of a person. And I'm definitely nowhere near that, although I clearly have somewhat above to maybe even above average to good genetics <clears throat> as far as building strength is concerned. My my genetics for building strength are probably better than my, my genetics for building muscle, to be fair. But we'll see. We'll see. You never know them until, until you know, I get more than a couple years of being enhanced under my belt, and that way I can compare to actual enhanced standards. I'm still, still a beginner at being enhanced. Did you ever find out who ratted you at the gym for yelling and calling you weak? No, and who cares? Uh, I mean, back in the days of the Powerlifting to Win YouTube channel, I was trolled pretty relentlessly by plenty of people, and if that was enough to make me quit lifting, I would have quit a long time ago. And frankly, more people at the gym <clears throat> like me and appreciate like the, the help that I give there, even including like some of my personal equipment that I let people use, than people who dislike it. And I'm pretty sure anyway that the yelling stuff was just because I trained really early in the morning and there's old people. And that's just how it is with old people. I'm gonna offend some people with this, but it just is what it is. The odds are you don't need a book. You just need to start. Because entrepreneurs, they don't ask this question. A hustler doesn't ask, how do I hustle? How do I think like a hustler? They're out there hustling. They have specific questions. An entrepreneur asks, how do I run Facebook ads more effectively to get people into my car dealership? How do I use a funnel to get people to buy my ebook? They have specific questions. They go to their account and they go, what's the best business structure for me to save money on taxes? Here's my books. Can you take a look? They don't go, how do I think like an entrepreneur? How do I start a business? You don't need another book, most likely. Because if you needed a book, you would have a specific question and you could go find a book that answers that question. The mindset is just do it. Just start. Just start. You have to just start and then you solve problems as you run into them. You don't need to sit there and, and, and prepare yourself to start with mindset books. Just start. Just do the first step right now. Any drugs that can help with joint health after multiple surgeries on my right knee, it's not the same anymore. Uh, yes. So acutely, um, you can run TP500 and PP157. And for, for more of a longer term thing, a low dose of HGH. And both the, the combination of both of those things will most likely make a big difference in your knee health. Now, you don't necessarily have to get this stuff off the black market. You could look into something like um, Transcend HRT if you're in the United States <clears throat> and potentially get these things prescribed, which is great because, you know, you can go through insurance possibly, but at the very least, you know that everything is real. But yes, peptides can help you for sure. Dude, I was just too lazy to write LBS for pounds. So P stands for pounds. R stands for reps. So if I write plus five P, that means I added five pounds from last time. And if I write plus two R, that means I added two reps from last time. So last time I did 280 for six, and this time I did 285 for eight. So five, five more pounds, two more reps. Do you use a seatbelt in leg extension and seated leg curl? I don't, but if I had like a seatbelt that I could put in my gym bag like a contortion belt i would definitely use it as far as i know gym pin is coming out with a product like that and so as soon as they do i will buy it and um you know i'll do some kind of a review or something or i'll definitely at least let everybody know whether or not i like it i've liked almost every product that i've gotten from gym pin 
So I suspect that that will be a useful addition as well. There's definitely also a lot of dip machines out there that don't have a seatbelt, which is ridiculous because you need a seatbelt on a dip machine. So it could be a useful product for a lot of you. How do you standardize reps on your hammer strength row variations? Well, first of all, you know, just do them the same way, right? Like sometimes people overcomplicate this stuff. You can just do your reps in the same way. But the way that I write rows is as soon as I cross a threshold of body English, and I mean, this is a little bit fuzzy and subjective because I, I don't have necessarily an objective way to define that. But once I start using too much body English, I write that as a cheat rep. So, you know, if I did eight without body English and two with quite a bit of body English, I will write eight plus two for my rep. How do you approach returning to pressing after a pec strain? No issue training around it, just curious. What I do is I will stay below three out of 10 pain, both in terms of the weight that I'm using and in terms of the range of motion that I try to take it through. And over time, I will try to build that up to a deeper and deeper range of motion and more and more weight. And usually if it's a minor pec strain, these things heal pretty quickly in my experience, like two to three to four weeks before, at most, before you know you're able to use full range of motion and at least light weights and start building. But that is what I do. I use pain, pain as a uh, tolerance guide, basically. Why do you seem to have just your elbows on the pad for preacher curl instead of your whole upper arm? Um, what? Look at, look at the picture. I definitely have my whole upper arm on the uh, preacher curl bench there. Kona and Mello are fighting for canine supremacy right now, so I'm sure the audio quality will be lovely. So this was one of the first movements of the day where I, I mean, besides the flies, obviously there was a discrepancy there, but not as big of a discrepancy as I was really expecting. I mean, only like one, one and a half reps on this one. Somebody literally asked me, drop some Insta IDs of pretty looking women's in your gym. No. Uh, dips were, <laughs> I did basically single arm assisted dips with quite a bit of assistance, obviously, because it would be weird to stabilize that. But this was one where I noticed a really big discrepancy between my right and left side, which I found odd. Um, I was really expecting the imbalance to become becoming mostly from my right pec, but it didn't show up on um, dumbbell presses or shoulder presses. So, but those are unstable exercises. So I'm, I'm wondering potentially if I might need to test this again with like machines and take stability out of the equation to see what the real discrepancy is between my right and left side. And that's, that's probably what I'm gonna try in my next pressing session. Is MK677 worth taking for joint health? Not asking for me, but for the guy who asked before. Uh, it's not really worth taking at all in my opinion. It's pretty much the same price as Chinese GH. So you might as well just get Chinese GH if you're gonna get a GH analog. Uh, MK677 is worse for your insulin sensitivity and it tends to make you super hungry. And in fact, that's really the main application, for it, I think. If you're at the end of a bulk and you're struggling with appetite and your insulin sensitivity is already kind of fucked anyway, you might be able to sque squeeze out another couple weeks of eating big food because of the MK677. But it, it's not something that I'd be using regularly because like I said, you can just get real Chinese GA and it's the same price. How to improve recovery other than sleep, food, proper programming, and PEDs. So other than all of the most important things, no, but um, stress management, deep relaxation, such as you might, you might get from a massage, compassionate touch and intimacy. Um, yes, sex improves recovery. Um, my guess is that a lot of people could really benefit from some sort of mindfulness practice. Meditation, especially breathing meditation, is going to be a popular option. And there's tons of apps nowadays that teach you how to do it. Like Headspace is the one that I referenced in this answer. But that is something that can really help you with really a deep relaxation and stress management. But those are the big ones, um, being more relaxed and uh, compassionate touch and stress management, better recovery. Do you deload and how do you go about it? These days with my volume as low as it is, I can't really cut my volume. So what I do when I need to deload is I just take complete time off um, and that'll be anywhere from four to seven days in a row. And I'll be honest, a lot of that is determined by how long I can actually keep myself out of the gym. I tend to only take these breaks when I'm completely fucked. So it, like when I don't feel like training, that's how I know I've gone way too far because I always love to train. Anyway, it's just four to seven days off and then I get back to it. Does stretching a muscle after a hard set do anything to promote growth? Yes, I mean, there are studies at this point on loaded stretches producing hypertrophy. This is something that people have been doing for decades, thanks to Dante Trudell and dog crap training. 
So if you're looking at ways that real people in real life have done this in their hypertrophy training and seen results, I would look up dog crap training and look at some of the examples of what Dante calls the extreme stretches. For quads in particular, um, it's kind of like a, a sissy, sissy squat stretch. So yeah, give that a look. It's pretty interesting stuff. I don't have some sort of preset amount of time that I take movements in and out. I keep them in for as long as I can. And if you're asking me like, what's the average amount of time that you have a movement in before it stalls? <clears throat> I don't know. The, the, mo the most common reason that I take a movement out is not because it actually stalled in progress. It's because it has started to hurt my joint or I've had some sort of change in priorities and there's a movement that addresses that priority better. There's been very few movements where I had to take it out because I actually could not progress it anymore. Um, and anytime that has happened, I've done two or three other movements for a while and then come back to it and I was able to progress it again. I've done the same handful of exercises for the most part for four straight years. Can you tag some other bodybuilders to follow and learn from? Besides you, I only follow JP and the La Martinas. If you're not following Dante Trudell, that's who, uh, the first place to start if you're interested in high intensity style training. That's basically who everybody learned from. Um, Dante is the OG, and right now he's making new posts about training on his blog, which you can directly find by going to his Instagram and clicking the link in his bio. So he's really easy to find on Instagram, at Dante underscore Trudell. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking to switch from beef to bison meat. What is your preference for protein? Well, bison meat has an incredible micronutrient profile, but if you're talking about bison steak, which is really the lean type of bison, it can be as much as $20 per pound or even more. So personally, I go with chicken because chicken is just as lean as bison. It might have worse micronutrients, but it's way, way cheaper. Why can some power lifters squat more than they deadlift? Usually this is because they are obese or have a very high body fat percentage and the extra fat improves the leverages on the squat. Your, the stomach jams into the thighs, creates more stability in the hole, kind of promotes an upright posture, and it does the exact opposite on deadlift. The stomach gets in the way, smashes into the legs. Now you have to open up your stance to a wider stance to accommodate the belly, which pushes out the grip, and now your deadlift leverages are significantly worse because you're using a clean grip instead of a narrow grip with, that produces vertical forearms in the locked out position. So there's other um, exceptions as well. Sometimes people have really short arms or really tiny hands and terrible grip, but mostly they're fat. For hypertrophy training, cold therapies are a complete and utter waste of time. They're actually contraindicated for growth because they interfere with the inflammatory processes that trigger and signal muscle growth. So they're actually a net negative for people that train for bigger muscles. For other sports, sometimes it can be worth you know, not having an inflamed knee so that you can play on the second night of a back-to-back -back in your basketball game. But most of us aren't basketball players, we are weightlifters. So for weightlifters, it's not something you should be doing. Uh, you can't really do that. The best appetite suppressants on the market currently are going to be the anti-obesity drugs that just came out. They're glucagon-like peptides. Um, we got the and Ozempic. <clears throat> so they were developed initially for people with type two diabetes but they are extremely, extremely, extremely effective at reducing appetite. So those are things that you can get on completely legally by talking to a doctor. Is the safety squat bar a decent hypertrophy exercise? It feels like my spinal erectors are the limiting factor. Yes, they're great, but I mean, if you're feeling completely limited by spinal erectors, maybe it's not great for you. That said, the longer you do them, the more that thoracic rounding goes away because you get stronger at holding your thoracics in extension. Um, However, another thing that you could be doing here is just using a really hip dominant technique. And if your hip shoot back on a safety bar squat, that is gonna increase that moment arm along the thoracic extensors and make it harder to keep your upper back tight. So when you're doing safety bar squats, I highly recommend heel elevation and thinking about pushing your hips forward the whole time. If you're squatting for quads, you want your knees pushed as far forward as possible the whole time, and you don't want your hips shooting back. If your hips are shooting back, your hips are taking it over and the load is being taken off the quads. How do you decide how many fruits and veggies to eat? I noticed you eat a lot of broccoli and pineapple. Actually, I don't eat any broccoli at all. It doesn't do well for me um, digestion-wise. But how you decide how many veggies and fruits you need to eat is you go log your food on chronometer, see which micronutrients you are deficient in, and then figure out which foods have those micronutrients and eat enough of them to fulfill your micronutrient needs. That's pretty much it. 
if you're dieting and really hungry, you can consider eating more veggies beyond that. And if you're, you know, massing and just always full, consider using just enough fruits and veggies to meet your micros. If my focus is hypertrophy, should I use leg drive for bench press? No, not powerlifting style leg drive. You really just need to drive your feet into the floor so that your pressing is stable. But you, you don't need to be looking to lift maximal loads and trying to get like carry over to get your leg drive to carry from your feet all the way through the upper body. Just, just drive your feet into the floor for stability. I would just basically treat it like a whole new exercise. Throw your PRs out the window. Um, using the new technique that you want to use with it going forward, warm up. Based on your warm ups, select your first weight, and then you can progress it from there. I mean, I would use my same progression method that I use for everything. So I would use um, simultaneous double progression with 1% micro load increases while trying to add reps. If I went too light on the first session, I would adjust it the next session. If I went too heavy, I would adjust it the next session. So yeah, I would just basically treat it like I'm starting a new exercise. I can't keep my leg straight on stiff leg deadlift without significantly reducing my range of motion. What should I do? Your legs shouldn't literally be straight on a stiff leg deadlift. They, your knees should be bent. And then from there, you just want to push your hips back and keep your knees from coming forward. Maintain a slight bend in your knee at all times. If you use an actually straight leg, this creates a really unstable and unsafe position for your hamstrings to generate a lot of force. And you will drastically not only limit the range of motion, but the weight that you can use as well. So a slight bend in the knee um, is what you want when you're doing RDLs when you're doing stiff leg deadlifts, you don't actually want a literally straight leg. A quick side note here, if you ever get a chance to use the hammer ground-based lunge, which is what this machine actually is, it's not actually a deadlift machine, <laughs> it sort of forces you into the perfect groove for RDLs and stiff leg deadlifts. Give it a try if you ever see it, I love how it feels. I wanna try your technique on DB preacher curls, but do you have any tips to avoid risk of a bicep rupture? You're not going to tear your bicep like use weights that you can actually lift go full range of motion with full elbow extension control the eccentric consider adding a slight pause at the bottom so you're not getting like a stretch reflex or trying to bounce off the tendon and have high forces in a dangerous position that's pretty much it the vast vast majority of injuries on preacher curls is because people do partial range of motion with shitty form then one day they pick too heavy of a weight they lose control of it the weight pulls them down into a range of motion that they never normally train and whoop, pop goes the weasel, they lose their bicep. So just, if you just lift with weights that you actually can lift and don't ego lift, at least not, don't completely ego lift, maybe pick some other lifts to the ego lift on, you know? And uh, you should be fine. You're, you're, you're not gonna be able to use much more than like a 30 pound dumbbell anyway. You shouldn't tear your bicep with that. Range of motion on a deadlift will be minimized when you select a grip width that places your arms exactly perpendicular to the ground. So as you can see here with the clean grip or even a really wide snatch grip, your arms are gonna be out at an angle. And so when viewed from that frontal plane, that actually makes them effectively shorter and you have to squat down slash bend over more to reach the bar. So in order to have a grip width where your arms are perfectly perpendicular to the floor, you either need your stance to be inside of that grip or outside of it, as in a sumo deadlift. If we're assuming conventional, then you're gonna to need to select a stance width where your heels are probably somewhere underneath roughly your shoulders or your hips, but you don't want your heels actually touching. There's no reason to do that. That's gonna limit stability and power output. From, a, from a, a joint stacking perspective, with your heels directly under your hip socket, that's where the joints stack. So it's not gonna be as close together as possible. Your stance will be narrow, but they'll still be 6 to 12 inches between your heels. All right, everybody. As always, if you like the video, like the video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.